Since you first obtained your copy of the program and looked through it, the title of Brother No's talk, which is now to follow, has most certainly aroused in you keen anticipation. Down with the old, up with the new. We welcome Brother No again to the platform to talk to us on this arresting subject, Brother No. Then people will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all the nations on account of my name. And this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for the purpose of a witness to all the nations. And then the accomplished end will come. The speaker of those words on account of whose name they would be hated by all the nations, was Jesus Christ. Those who would be hated by all the nations were his disciples, followers who were associated with his name and who preached in his name. They were Christians. Christians of a real sort, not afraid to endure hatred on account of his name, when was his hatred to burn against them? The time verb, then, locates it at the time when Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be food shortages and earthquakes in one place after another. All these things are the beginning of pangs of distress. This beginning of pangs of distress, with more pangs and severer pangs due to come, was to mark the beginning of the consummation of the system of things. Our well-known modern history supplies us with the proof that that beginning of pangs of distress that beginning of the consummation of the system of things was 44 years ago in the year 1914. On July the 28th of that year, the kingdom of Austria declared war on the kingdom of Serbia. World War I followed, accompanied by the many other things that Jesus foretold. On that momentous time, something began to go down and something else began to come up. According to the words of Jesus, just quoted, his real and true followers must have something to do with the nations. Of course, they may have nothing to do with the national politics, yet they do find themselves living among the nations of the earth, there to suffer, being hated by all the nations, and there to preach this good news of the kingdom everywhere for the purpose of a witness to all the nations, which means also those nations in Europe and in North and Central and South America. Why should they be hated by all nations? It cannot be just on account of Christ's name in Europe and in the Americas as well as in the rest of Christendom there are hundreds of millions of people who are called Christians and they are by no means hated. Remember that they are rather loved by the nations of the world. Still, anyone can take a name. So, besides the mere name, there must be another reason that causes this hatred by one and all the nations. This other thing must be that which Christ truly named followers do in fulfillment of his own prophecy. It must be their preaching of this good news of the kingdom for the purpose of a witness. What kingdom? Well, which kingdom or which political government on earth today is a source of good news? None. 
Jesus did not prophetically refer to any of these. There was just one kingdom that he always talked about, just one, so that there is no mistaking. That is the kingdom of God. It is the only source for good news today. Jesus' followers today mark themselves as genuine Christians by preaching just this kingdom and by we being willing to be hated by all the nations for their preaching of this kingdom. Nothing, therefore, is plainer than this, that Jesus Christ foretold that his followers, who would bear witness to all the nations, would have startling things to say or preach about the ending of the old and the beginning of the new. For this reason, they would raise a storm of international protest and would suffer, suffer hatred by all the old nations. In this regard, they are very much like the ancient prophet Jeremiah, who lived and preached more than 600 years before Jesus Christ. When Jesus was on earth, Jews mistook him for Jeremiah the prophet. Jesus quoted things from the prophecy of Jeremiah. In turn, Jeremiah foretold things concerning Jesus Christ. Jeremiah also foretold important things concerning the followers of Jesus. In fact, Jeremiah prophetically prefigured the remnant or remaining ones of Jesus' consecrated, anointed followers on earth in this time of the outgoing of the old and the incoming of the new. The time of Jeremiah's living greatly determined this prefigurement and its uh, fulfillment today. He began prophesying at a time when a most heart-rendering thing was about to happen, a thing almost unbelievable. This was the destruction of the holy city of Jerusalem and the plundering and burning down of its temple dedicated to the worship of Jehovah God. Just 40 years from when Jeremiah began to prophesy in witness of Jehovah, a tremendous religious shock took place from 647 before Christ, which was the 13th year of the reign of the good king Josiah in Jerusalem, to 607 before Christ, the year that the Babylonian armies under the conquering king Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple built by Solomon the Wise. Today, Fear is more and more being expressed for the organized religion of Christendom. What is to come of it? For an answer, people should listen to the plain preaching by the remnant prefigured by Jeremiah, for these preach to men the present-day fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. Who made them a prophet to speak with the authority that they claim? Well... Who made Jeremiah a prophet? Jeremiah was a son of a Jewish priest in the city of Anathoth, in the northern part, uh, to the north of Jerusalem. That fact did not automatically make him a prophet. He did not make himself a prophet. He could not have done so, especially since he was set apart to be a prophet before he was even born. Still, he could of his own accord agree to and submit to serving as a prophet when told of the vocation for which he was marked out. Jeremiah tells us how and by whom he became a prophet. The word of Jehovah began to come to me, saying, Behold, I proceeded to form you in the belly. Before I proceeded to form you in the belly, I knew you. And before you began to come forth from the womb, I sanctified you. Prophet to the nations, I made you. But I said, Alas, O Lord Jehovah, here I actually do not know how to speak, for I am but a boy. And Jehovah went on to say to me, Do not say, I am but a boy. But to all those to whom... I shall send you, you should go, and everything that I shall command you, you should speak. Do not be afraid because of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, is the utterance 
of Jehovah. It is evident that Jeremiah was born for a work. The question was, would he fit himself to the work? Would he be willing to undertake it? His feeling unequal to the assignment did not decide the matters. Jeremiah did not resist or rebel because work was cut out for him. Showing still further how God made him a prophet, he tells us, Jehovah proceeded to thrust his hand out and caused it to touch his mouth. Then Jehovah said to me, Here, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have commissioned you this day to be over the nations and over the kingdoms in order to uproot and to pull down and to destroy and tear down, to build and to plant. Jeremiah as being a boy, either in years or in his own estimation, was no real obstacle. When one is young is when one should make it one's purpose to take on God's work. Besides, in Jeremiah's case, it was to be no short-term job. In his case, it was to be a responsible work of 40 years in length and then some. For him to carry it out in its fullness, it was timely for him to begin when young, in boyhood, when he had the larger part of his life yet ahead of him. So Jehovah brushed aside Jeremiah's fear of being too young. He said, Do not say, I am but a boy. Since it was a rule for young persons to show respect toward the old, it would, be re it would require something unusual for a boy to speak sternly to older men. But Jehovah was older than any of Israel's elders. So he said to the boy, Jeremiah, Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, is the utterance of Jehovah. The whole question then was this. Was Jeremiah willing... In the year 1914, the prophecy of Jesus began fulfillment. The consummation of the system of things began for this world. There were hundreds of millions who claimed to be Christ's disciples, the vast majority of these being found in Christendom. The consummation of the system of things was the time for the great work to be done, a work that would run from the beginning of that period of consummation until the accomplished end of it. It was a work toward all the inhabited earth, to all the nations, a work of being witnesses to all these nations concerning God's kingdom of good news. For more than four years, World War I occupied the time and attention of over 30 nations. Still, they fought right up until 1918. And the religious systems of Christendom threw themselves into the war on the sides of their respective nations. Certainly they had no time for preaching God's kingdom of good news then. As regards Jehovah's Witnesses, the religious systems of Christendom stirred up the political, military, and judicial authorities to cut down or almost stop the public preaching that Jehovah's Witnesses were trying to do concerning the meaning of world conditions and the times and events. Came the year 1919, and the work of witnessing to the nations in fulfillment of Jesus' words was still there to do. It faced all men who claimed to follow and obey Jesus. In that opening year of post-war decision and work, the question of highest importance to Christendom and to all who called themselves Christians was not should all nations get together in a peace league, but who will be Jehovah's prophet to the nations to speak to them everything that he should command? Who will be the modern Jeremiah? Jeremiah prophesied 40 years in the time of the end of the kingdom of Judah. So who will prophesy with his message in this time of the end 
of the nations of this world. Back there, about 40 years ago, that was the question. Today, we may ask, how was the question answered? There are facts to show. We should not appeal to religious pride or boasting or self-made claims. We should appeal to the facts. Let facts speak for themselves. Consult the factual record of Christendom's religious systems, Catholic and Protestant, not to speak of Jewry. More than that, examine also that those religious systems, what those religious systems are doing today. Then consult the record of the one religious organization that all Christendom's religious organizations and Jewry strenuously opposed during World War I and have opposed since. Everybody knows that this opposed organization of Christians is Jehovah's Witnesses. Consult the newspaper reports or magazine articles, the police and judicial court records. Yes, consult the homes of the millions of people who have been visited by these witnesses of Jehovah apart from their own annual report in the yearbook of Jehovah's Witnesses. Ask all these what the witnesses have been doing since 1919 till this very hour. The combined answer will be that they have been preaching by all the means and channels of publicity. They have specialized on preaching just one thing, and that is God's kingdom of good news. It has been because Jehovah thrust out his hand of power and touched their lips and put his words in their mouths. It has evidently been because he commissioned them to be over the nations and over the kingdoms. Happy are all those who have seen that the work of Jehovah God from now is and from now on will be done by those who volunteer to do it. Individuals have not been foreordained for God's work as in Jeremiah's case. The work was the thing foreordained. Christendom may fail to, be or to do the ordained work, but it will be done just the same by God's chosen people. We must harmonize with the work, not decide for ourselves what work God wants us to do in this time of the end, but we must ask for the divine blessing and look for what God wants us to do. If we do not follow the divine work, then we would show lawlessness against God, no matter how loudly and intensely one claims to be a Christian. God offers the ordained work to Christians as these claim to have given themselves to him through Christ to do the divine will. Thus God lets Christians live up to their claim if they want to, by accepting the work he or for, that he foreordained Christians in this time of the end to do. Regardless of the names of the individuals, a remnant of consecrated, anointed witnesses of Jehovah rejoice to be freed from their captivity during World War I and to carry out their dedication to God by taking up this foreordained work. Hundreds of thousands have since seen the opportunity of the work and have joyfully joined the anointed Jeremiah class in doing this great uh, work of preaching the good news. Jehovah's Witnesses may be comparatively few in number. They do not have any political ties or influence. Nonetheless, their work is of world importance because it was foreordained by God. It was foreshadowed and outlined by Jeremiah's own work, which was of world importance. Jehovah's Witnesses are absolutely neutral toward the politics, the ideological uh, and military conflicts of this world, and yet they are under divine command to declare Jehovah's message concerning the nations and the kingdoms of this world. As pictured by Jeremiah, they are commissioned to uproot, to pull down, and to destroy and to tear down. 
and at the same time to build and to plant. That is the work that Jehovah's Witnesses have been doing during these past 40 years. In all that work, they have not meddled in politics, subverted any governments, or raised a violent hand against any of the institutions or political structures of any nation of the world. How, then, have they filled Jehovah's Commission to them? Our guide to the right answer is found in the answer to the question, how did our pattern, Jeremiah, fulfill his commission to do such things? He did this by declaring the judgments, the judicial decisions, and the purposes of Jehovah God, which when pronounced over Jehovah's own name, are as good as accomplished. Thus he calls the things that are not as though they were. Not one of his judgments and purposes has gone unfulfilled. Jehovah God formed man of the dust of the ground. Quite rightly then, Jehovah compares himself to a great potter or fashioner of vessels in supreme control of the product of his hands. As such fashioner, he is unchallengeable. It does not do a bit of good to challenge him on what he is doing or how he expresses his will. He says, As the clay in the hand of the potter, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. At any moment that I may speak against a nation and against the kingdom to uproot it and to pull it down and to destroy it, and that nation actually turns back from its badness against which I spoke, I will also feel sorry over the calamity that I have thought to execute upon it. But at any moment that I may speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build it up and to plan it, and it actually does what is bad in my eyes by not obeying my voice, I will also feel sorry over the good that I said to myself to do for its good. Long ago, Jehovah God illustrated his power as a world potter and made and broke nations. The ruins of ancient world powers and kingdoms those of Israel and of Judah, of Babylon, of Edom, of Moab, of Ammon, and of other ancient political powers stand as warning examples of how he uproots, how he pulls down, destroys and tears down mighty governments, great cities, and power-wielding populations and their institutions. In such case, he poured out his judgment upon the nations or the world power that offended against him and fought against him. He always had his chosen executioner to carry out the divine word and make it live toward the offenders and fighters against him. Is not my word correspondingly like fire, is the utterance of Jehovah, and like a forge hammer that smashes a crag? Let the nations of today not despise the word of Jehovah God, come though it may through the internationally hated body of Christians known as Jehovah's Witnesses. What they are saying and preaching to the nations is not their own word. It is taken from God's written word. So then, says Paul, the man that shows disregard is disregarding not man but God who put his Holy Spirit upon you. As early as 1877, Jehovah's Witnesses, who are associated with the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania, came out in print to the effect that 1914 was the date marked in God's Bible for the Gentile times, the appointed times of the nations, to end. This meant that something new was due to begin during 1914, and something old was to end or enter, in, or enter into the time of its end. That something new 
was God's kingdom of the heavens, prayer for the establishment of which had gone up for near unto 1900 years. The something old was this world, not this earth, which 60 nations are scientifically studying during the international geophysical year, but the bedeviled man-made system of things on the surface of this earth. Since 1914, the year to which Jehovah's Witnesses pointed long in advance, this old world has never been the same. The distress and perplexity have continued and increased upon it. Says he, you must say to them, this is what Jehovah of armies, the God of Israel, has said. Drink and get drunk and puke and fall so that you cannot get up because of the sword that I am sending among you. And it must occur that in case they refuse to take the cup out of your hand to drink, you must also say to them, this is what Jehovah of armies has said, you must drink without fail, for look, it is upon the city upon which my name is called that I am starting off in bringing calamity. And should you yourselves in any way go free of punishment, you will not go free of punishment, for there is a sword that I am calling against all the inhabitants of the earth is the utterance of Jehovah God. <laughs> Copying the unfaithful nation of Israel in Jeremiah's day, unchristian Christendom of this 20th century claims to be called by God's name and to represent him. Jehovah God will hold Christendom accountable for not living up to the divine name. At the universal war of Armageddon which draws near, Jehovah will tell his executional officer, Jesus Christ, to swing down the sword of destruction upon the hypocritical religious organization. Let not the communist eastern bloc of nations, either the non-Christian nations outside, gloat because of the coming destruction of the so-called Christian Western Bloc, or more particularly Christendom. If Jehovah considers Christendom, which pretends to bear his name and to stand for God to the world, to be punished, do communist Russia and its satellites and the non-Christian nations of the world think that they are going to go unpunished? Have they loved Jehovah God more than Christendom has? Have they refrained from opposing and fighting against Jehovah God and his witnesses? Have they been guiltless as to doing filthy things and sinning against him? No. And Jehovah says that they will not go free of punishment, but his executional sword will be upon all the inhabitants of the earth. Consequently, they have not gone unwarned by Jehovah's Witnesses behind the Iron Curtain or on this side. <laughs> Hear this. This is what Jehovah of Armies has said. Look, a calamity is going forth from nation to nation, and a great tempest itself will be roused up from the remotest part of the earth. And those slain by Jehovah will certainly come to be in that day from one end of the earth clear to the other end of the earth. They will not be bewailed, neither will they be gathered up and buried. As manure on the surface of the ground they will become. Then addressing himself to the political rulers backed by the religious leaders and the commercial, industrial and financial princes, he says, Howl, you shepherds, and cry out, and wallow about, you majestic ones of the flock, for your days for slaughtering and for your acts of scattering have been fulfilled, and you must fall like a desirable vessel, and a place to flee to has perished from the shepherd, and a means of escape for the majestic ones of the flock. Listen! the outcry of the shepherds and the howling of the majestic ones of the flock, for Jehovah is despoiling their pastorage. <laughs> 
What took place long ago when Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylonian world power, swept through the Middle East and down into Egypt is a small, human-scale illustration of what Jehovah's mightier executional servant, Jesus Christ, will do when he sweeps around the entire globe from nation to nation and destroys the old worldly system of things. For preaching such a message as this, to the nations. Jehovah's Witnesses may be charged with being subversive. Jeremiah was charged that way. The religious leaders tried to have the political princes kill him, quoting, Then the priests and the prophets and all the people proceed to lay hold on him, saying, You will positively die. Why is it that you have been prophesying in the name of Jehovah, saying, like that in Shiloh is how the house, this temple will become, and this very city will be devastated so as to be without an inhabitant. Then they said to the princes of Jerusalem, To this man the judgment of death belongs, because he has prophesied concerning this city, because, as you have heard, with your own ears. Jeremiah defended himself, saying, it was Jehovah that sent me to prophesy concerning this house and concerning this city all the words that you have heard. And as for me, here I am in your hand. Do to me according to what is good and according to what is right in your eyes. Only you should by all means know that if you are putting me to death, it is innocent blood that you are putting upon yourselves and upon this city and upon her inhabitants. For in truth, Jehovah did send me to you to speak in your ears all these words. At that time, the princes showed courage enough to stand up against the religious leaders and false prophets and refused to put Jehovah's Witnesses to death. That is, Jehovah's Witness back there in Jeremiah. That was 22 years before Jerusalem was destroyed. Later, in the ninth year of King Zedekiah, the Chaldean armies under King Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem. When they heard that Pharaoh of Egypt was coming up to relieve the city, they lifted the siege and they withdrew. But Jeremiah uprooted and pulled down Jerusalem by predicting that that city was doomed, said he. The Chaldeans will certainly come back and fight against this city and capture it and burn it with fire. This is what Jehovah has said. Do not deceive your souls. Afterward, Jeremiah was accused of deserting to the Chaldeans. On his way out through one of Jerusalem's gates, he was seized by the official guard at the gate who said, It is to the Chaldeans that you are falling away. Jeremiah was then put in the house of detention. Even from there, Jeremiah told King Zedekiah himself that the enemy of the Chaldeans would come back and capture King and the city. When released, Jeremiah preached the same thing. He told the people to surrender to King Nebuchadnezzar if they wanted to escape destruction inside the city by sword, famine, and by pestilence. The political princes did not uh, take the message to heart in faith and act on it. They misinterpreted the message and said to the king, Let this man, please, be put to death. For that is how he is weakening the hands of the men of war who are left remaining in this city and the hands of all the people by speaking to them according to these words. For this man is one seeking not for the peace of this people but for calamity. Jeremiah was now arrested and lowered into a waterless pit into a cistern with a miry bottom. There Jeremiah was left to sink into the mire. However, the Ethiopian eunuch was man enough to get him out from that death hole. Jeremiah was then kept under detention in the courtyard of the guard 
until Jerusalem fell and release came to him at the hand of the Chaldeans. In these days, when the political governments find it advisable to take special security measures, and when it is popular for certain religious clergymen to cry, Communist! Because Jehovah's Witnesses foretell the destruction of Christendom in the universal war of Armageddon. We cannot alter our message. When, in, when under any arrest and imprisonment, we must stick to the message that Jehovah God has commissioned us to preach because it is the truth, and it is true and certain to be fulfilled. <laughs> That's why we cannot alter the message, just to please the people and their chosen religious leaders. Changing the message will not save anyone, not even our own selves. Like Jerusalem, Christendom is doomed to extinction and with her all the rest of this worldly system of things in the war of the great day of God the Almighty. His heavenly field marshal Jesus Christ will destroy unchristian Christendom because it has hypocritically misrepresented him before all of the non-Christian peoples of the nation. Those who stick inside Christendom by adhering to its religious systems will die in the universal war of Armageddon just as those who stayed inside Jerusalem and did not go out to the, besiege, the besieging king of Babylon. They died miserably inside the city. By our message against Christendom, we do not advise or encourage people to go over to the ungodly communistic type of worship. In harmony with Jeremiah, we urge the liberty-loving, life-loving people to go out to the conquering King Jesus Christ. From the Holy Bible, we educate the people to take upon themselves the yoke of the King Jesus Christ and to serve him. We tell them, the political, we tell even the political rulers to do this, just as Jeremiah strongly urged King Zedekiah to do similarly. It means their life, their eternal life. To take the yoke of the reigning King Jesus Christ upon one, even so late as this, in the world's time of the end, means sweet refreshment to one's soul. Hundreds of thousands of sheep-like people all around the earth have already found that out. Jesus Christ, although now in battle dress for the universal war of Armageddon, still says, Come to me, all you who are toiling and loaded down, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you and become my disciple, for I am mild-tempered, and lowly in heart, and you will find refreshment for your souls. For my yoke is kindly, and my load is light. It is like the wooden yoke or yoke bar, and he helps us to bear it, rather than to press us down and to crush us with it. Bearing his yoke now works for our life in the new world. The priests and prophets of Christendom take the position of the false prophet Hananiah and other religious leaders who oppose Jeremiah. They deny that Jesus Christ, now reigning in the midst of his enemies since 1914, is against Christendom and will destroy it, and that it is very urgent to desert Christendom without delay and dedicate oneself to Jehovah God and truly follow in Christ's footsteps, bearing his yoke according to the Holy Scriptures and not according to the religious creeds of Christendom. If people follow the advice of men like Hananiah and refuse to get out of Christendom and bow their neck under the yoke of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, it will go very hard with them in the Battle of Armageddon. The prophet Hananiah broke the wooden yoke far from off Jeremiah's neck he said that 
Jeremiah's illustration of his prophecy was false, and that just as he, Hananiah, had broken the yoke of wood, so inside of two full years, Jehovah would break Nebuchadnezzar's yoke from off the neck of all the nations. Jehovah told Jeremiah to say to Hananiah that iron yoke bars were what was in store now instead of a wooden one. A yoke of iron I will put upon the necks of all these nations to serve Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon and they must serve him and even the wild beasts of the field I will give him. Another thing, Hananiah, who had spoken outright revolt against Jehovah God, must die. He did die, and he died that very year. Jeremiah was right. What will happen to the people who today choose to follow religious leaders like Hananiah? Jesus said, If then a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. The choice now before all people is between a symbolic wooden yoke with life for our souls in the new world or an iron yoke with death for revolt against Jehovah and his king. Jeremiah has been called a prophet of gloom. Gloom, yes, for the wicked who deserve it, Because the holy name of his God, Jehovah, was implicated, Jeremiah could give way to the expressions of grief contained in his book of Lamentations. Yet Lamentations is a book of great poetic beauty. It breathes of Jehovah's righteousness. It pours out sorrow for sin against him. It wells up with hope in merciful restoration and reconstruction by him. And it draws consolation from the divine vengeance that is coming upon those who have taken part and rejoice in working ruin upon Jehovah's people. Because the enemy gloated and bragged, because they taunted and reproached God's name, because the symbols of Jehovah's typical religion were wrecked and overthrown, and because Jehovah's people grew so rebellious, unfaithful, and worldly as they deserved this painful experience, it made the prophet Jeremiah sad. Still, it came in fulfillment of Jeremiah's preaching, in which Jeremiah uprooted and pulled down, destroyed and tore down with descriptive language. (coughs) Happily, Jeremiah was also commissioned to build and to plant. It was he who foretold of a miraculous restoration of Jehovah's people, this resulting in an overflow of joy. Jeremiah was the one who said these touching words of Jehovah to his visible organization. With a love to time and definite, I have loved you, That is why I have drawn you with loving kindness. Yet shall I rebuild you, and you will actually be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. You will yet deck yourself with your tambourines and actually go forth in the dance of those who are laughing. You will yet plant vineyards in the mountains of Samaria. The planters will certainly plant and begin to use them. For there exists a day when the lookouts in the mountainous region of Ephraim will actually call out, Rise up, O men, and let us go up to Zion, to Jehovah our God. Jeremiah dispelled gloom by foretelling that the captive ones of Jehovah's people would return from the land of the enemy. Jeremiah also foretold the new covenant that Jesus Christ was to mediate with God for his body of followers, the nation of spiritual Israel. In this covenant, Jehovah said, I will put my law into the midst of them, and in their heart I will write it, and I will become their God, and they themselves will become my people. 
for they will all of them know me from the least one of them even to the greatest of them for I shall forgive their error and their sin I shall remember no more. Jeremiah saw how the typical throne of Jehovah in Jerusalem was empty of its last king, Zedekiah. He saw how Jehovah's chief priests of the temple, Zariah and the second priest, Zephaniah, were killed by the Babylonian executioner. Yet, Jeremiah built and planted by joyfully declaring that Jehovah's covenants with King David and with the Levite priesthood for a kingdom of priests and a holy nation of king priests, a royal priesthood, would endure. This is what Jehovah has said. If you people could break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, even in order for day and night not to occur in their time, Likewise, could my own covenant be broken with David, my servant, so that he should come to have a son ruling as king upon his throne. Also with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. Just as the army of the heavens cannot be counted, neither the sand of the seas be measured, so I shall multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites who are ministering to me. Likewise today. Jehovah's Witnesses preach for a witness to all the nations of good news that Jehovah has planted an enduring kingdom of his king priest like Melchizedek, Jesus Christ. With himself in the heavenly kingdom, Jesus will have the full 144,000 anointed followers who will be priests of God and of Christ and who will rule as kings with him for the thousand years. By that kingdom, Mankind will procure eternal blessings. Look, there are days coming is the utterance of Jehovah, and I will raise up to David a righteous sprout, and a king will certainly reign, and act with discretion and execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his day, Judah will be saved, and Israel itself will reside in security. And this is his name with which he will be called Jehovah is our righteousness. In his prophetic work, Jeremiah did more than build up and plant the only government of hope, the everlasting kingdom of God's new world. He also built up and planted a great crowd of sheep-like worshippers of Jehovah getting these into that new world without their dying. Jehovah used Jeremiah to cause persons to reveal themselves as illustrations of these other sheep. Who were they? Jerusalem was then in its time of the end. King Jehoiakim, who cut up a scroll of Jeremiah's prophecy and pitched it into the fire, still reigned but was undergoing pressure by the king of Babylon and his armies. Cooped up in the city with Jeremiah was a tribe of Rechabites who were like Israelites, but yet worshippers of Jehovah. Rather, they were not Israelites, but yet they worshipped Jehovah. God told Jeremiah to bring the Rechabite men to the temple and give them wine to drink. The Rechabites absolutely would not drink it. They explained, saying, quote, We keep obeying the voice of Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, our forefather, in everything that he commanded us by drinking no wine all our days. We, our wives, our sons, and our daughters, and by not building houses for us to dwell in so that no vineyard or field or seed should become ours. And we keep dwelling in tents and obeying and doing according to all that Jonadab, our forefather, commanded us. If men like these Rechabites unswervingly kept the commands of their forefathers, 
Why could not and why did not the Israelites keep the commands of their heavenly life-giving, their life-giver, their God, Jehovah? The faithful example of the God-fearing Rechabites condemned the God-forsaking Israelites. Therefore, let Jerusalem and its wicked inhabitants go down in destruction, but let the Rechabites live on. Hence, Jeremiah said to them, This is what Jehovah of armies, the God of Israel, has said. For the reason that you have obeyed the commandment of Jehonadab, your forefather, and continued keeping all his commandments and doing according to all that he commanded you, therefore this is what Jehovah of armies, the God of Israel, has said. There will not be cut off from Jonadab, the son of Rechab, a man to stand before me always. Even so, the Rechabites survived the destruction and came, that came on Jehovah's unfaithful people by his execution. Just as their forefather, Jehonadab, had survived the slaughter of Baal worship of Israelites in their idolatrous temple, today in association, With the anointed Jeremiah class, there is a great crowd of other sheep. These condemn Christendom by refusing to join with her in forsaking Jehovah in order to go over to materialism and selfish idolatry. God's promise to the Rechabites assures these other sheep that they will survive Christendom's destruction and live on into God's new world of righteousness. King Jehoiakim's son succeeded him and reigned on Jehovah's throne for just three months. Then Jehoiakim's brother, Zedekiah, was made king. In the ninth year of his reign, Jerusalem again came under siege by the king of Babylon and his armies for keeping on warning that Jerusalem would be burned and tore down and Jeremiah was arrested, charged with sedition and put down in a cistern where he sank into the mire. To his rescue, in defiance of the princes, there came not a circumcised Israelite, but a castrated Ethiopian, a eunuch named Ebed Amelech. He condemned what the princes had done to Jehovah's prophet. At King Zedekiah's order, Ebed Melek took along 30 men for safety and for assistance and got Jeremiah out of the miry death hole. After that, thanks to Ebed Melek, Jeremiah continued to dwell in the courtyard of the guard. During Jerusalem's siege, Mothers boiled their own children for food against starvation. Many died of pestilence, and many died by the sword of the Babylonians. But what of Ebed-Melech, who was in the house of King Zedekiah? Jehovah commanded Jeremiah in the courtyard of the guard to tell his rescuer, Ebed-Melech, I will deliver you in that day, is the utterance of Jehovah. And you will not be given into the hand of the men because of whom you yourself are in fright. For I shall without fail furnish you an escape, and by the sword you will not fall. And you will certainly come to have your soul as a spoil, because you have trusted in me is the utterance of Jehovah. Today, near Christendom's destruction at Armageddon, A sheep-like class, like Ebed-Melech, have put their trust in Jeremiah's God. They have proved this trust by being willing to risk death at the hands of Christendom's princes in order to come to the rescue of the antitypical Jeremiah of today. To the extent that you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me said the King Jesus Christ to the other sheep in his parable of the sheep and goats, the last part of his prophecy on the world's end. In this day of the judgment of the nations, Jesus Christ the King, seated on his heavenly throne for judgment work, 
turns to his right and says to these sheep, Come, you who have my father's blessing, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the world's foundation. I was in prison, and you came to me. Since the year 1914, the heavenly kingdom is here, and this green earth is its realm. These sheep-like persons of the ebed melek kind do not have to die to be resurrected in order to enter into the realm of that kingdom of God's new world. They are already living in the kingdom's earthly realm. This is the realm they must inherit, and so they are not going to be evicted from this earthly inheritance of theirs. Christendom is cursed, but these sheep have the blessing of the king's father, Jehovah God. Christendom, <laughs> Christendom with its goats will be destroyed, for it has no place in this earthly kingdom realm. But the king's father, Jehovah, will remember his promise to ebed melech at Jerusalem's destruction. So these blessed, sheep-like Christians will not fail, or rather fall, by the executioner's sword at the Battle of Armageddon. This morning, we saw 7,136 stand before us to be baptized. All of these other sheep that were baptized today in the ocean symbolizing their dedication to Jehovah God may expect by Jehovah's undeserved kindness to go through this battle of Armageddon and stand on God's green earth under the kingdom of heaven there to worship Jehovah forever. In that battle, they will certainly come to, ha to have their soul, their life, as a victor's spoil. This guarantees that they will live through the crash of Christendom and its religious temples and will begin to enjoy their earthly inheritance in the eternal new world by maintaining sheep-like obedience toward their shepherd king. They will never die off the earth, their inheritance. The goats will depart into everlasting cutting off, but the righteous ones into everlasting life said Jesus the judge. <laughs> Just as with Jeremiah, so with the anointed remnant and their companions, these righteous sheep-like ones. Heavy is the reproach that they bear because of their work of uprooting, pulling down, destroying, and tearing down the old world by means of preaching the day of Jehovah's vengeance. But should we, on that account, stop filling ourselves with Jehovah's word and quit, quit preaching this hard message? We cannot. Even as Jeremiah said, he could not. Take note of my bearing reproach on account of your own self. Your words were found, and I proceeded to eat them. And your words became to me an exaltation and a rejoicing of my heart. For your name has been called upon me, O Jehovah God of armies. Even because we do a building and a planting work in favor of God's new world, the lovers and supporters of the old world oppose us and try to force us to stop. But fired as we are with God's word, how can we stop speaking? To quote Jeremiah, The word of Jehovah became for me a cause of reproach, and for jeering all day long. And I said, I am not going to make mention of him, and I shall not speak no more in his name. And in my heart it proved to be like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I got tired of holding it in, and I was unable to endure it. Sing to Jehovah, you people. Praise Jehovah, for he has delivered the soul of the poor every one out of the hands of the evildoers.
therefore an expression of the theme of our preaching. Down with the old world, up with the new world. The almighty God of the new world bids us not to be afraid of the enemy's faces. They will be certain to fight against you, but they will not prevail against you, for I am with you, is the utterance of Jehovah to deliver you. <laughs> True to his promise, he delivered Jeremiah and the Rechabites and ebed melech when Jerusalem perished. True to that prophetic picture, Jehovah of armies will deliver us, the remnant and the other sheep, when at Armageddon. He fulfills what we have preached, and he brings down the old world and brings up his righteous new world. With such a marvelous message from Jeremiah and the messages we heard the last few days from Isaiah, God's prophet, it is a fitting time to release to you the fourth volume of the New World Translation. This volume contains the very latest translation of Isaiah using the Isaiah scroll, the latest Hebrew text that could be found, also translating Jeremiah and the Lamentations of Jeremiah. These three books of the Bible make up volume four of the New World Translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. There is one more. There is one more volume to come out, and I know that the New World Translation Committee is working on it, and they're trying to get it out just as soon as they possibly can, but there's a lot of work in translation. But we are indeed grateful to the New World Translation Committee for their wonderful work, and we thank first of all Jehovah God for this book and the committee that he has used in bringing it to us. You will be able to get this copy this afternoon as soon as you are dismissed by the chairman on a contribution of one dollar any place around the auditorium here and in the polo grounds. The pioneers and the missionaries may get a free copy by going to the book rooms and there showing your identification card or your meal ticket and you can get a copy free. We were not able to get out very many copies of the deluxe edition, just 500 before convention time, but if any of you would like to get a deluxe edition, you can go to the book room and get them as long as we last, and as you know, they are $3 a copy. This is $1 contribution, the regular edition, and may Jehovah's rich blessing go with you as you read Isaiah and Jeremiah and the Lamentations of Jeremiah, and may it put the spirit of Jeremiah in your very bones to preach this message which God has put in your mouths all to his glory and praise.